Welcome back to the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. My guest today is Mason Lashina from Atlas Island. Mason, how's it going, man? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Where are you calling in from today? Uh, right now, I'm in Windsor, Ontario, so uh, just south of Detroit. Okay, awesome. So, I like to throw that up to the Americans that I'm in Canada, but I'm looking north of Detroit right now. Yes, you got, um, I don't even know, factories in the background. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Mason, I heard about originally through another podcast guest, Andy J. Starr. And Mason and Atlas Island is one of the most ambitious and fascinating projects out there. The idea is basically a free city at sea. And Mason will explain exactly what this means. But, you know, he's spoken at the Free Cities Foundation. He's uh, spoken with the the Seasteading Institute um, and the Special Economic Zones people. And so it's kind of a continuation of a lot of the episodes we've done in that vein. But Mason, do you want to tell us a little bit at a high level? What is Atlas Island? Absolutely. So you you really nailed it right on the head. There is uh, looking to develop a free city um, in the ocean. And what I like to think of it is, is an amalgamation of ideas I've come across over the years, uh, namely free cities, seasteading, anarcho-capitalism. Um, and when you put all those ideas together, they really make a very uh, synergistic and um, complementary way of doing things. So at a high level, what Atlas Island is, is it's the concept that uh, each person would have their own floating vessel. Now, whether that's a, you know, a catamaran, a solar electric catamaran, which is what I'm personally aiming at, um, maybe another kind of um, vessel or, or boat, perhaps it's a sea pod as being developed by ocean builders, or it's a more traditional floating house. So each family or individual person would have their own floating structure, and that would be their personal private property. They would be able to flag that in whatever country that they found most advantageous to their personal tax and liberty situation. And then those platforms and ships would come together and form a floating community. And in addition to those, you know, individual family run platforms, there would be larger central platforms where these could all hook up to other, you know, like uh, if you can imagine a floating marina in the ocean or potentially a, a larger structure with an internal marina. And that would serve essentially as the, the business hub of a community. So all the houses or residential areas would be individually owned and floating separately. Then they would agglomerate together around a central business district. And this district would be operated as a private city. And, you know, really the, the benefit of it is, is multifold. First of all, um, it, you know, being in the ocean off the hop, uh, when you're flying a flag, that gives you essentially the most liberty you can have anywhere on the world. Um, you know, most countries that allow you to uh, essentially rent their flags provide more liberty at sea than they do on land. But moreover, in addition to that, uh, you will have different countries competing for your business as customers looking to rent their flag. So you'll have the Bahamas and, you know, Liberia and maybe um, Palau uh, or other countries looking to uh, solicit your business as um, virtual residents by by renting their flag or flagging your vessel in their country. And they'll be competing by offering better deals at lower prices with more freedom. And then on top of that, you have these central business districts that will be privately operated, you know, like in the, the free private city model as advocated by uh, Titus Gable and the, the free cities uh, foundation. But moreover, not only do you have a free city, but the free city is separate from your house. So if you don't like the way things are operating, not only do they have the incentive to keep you from a business perspective, but you can then also take your house, your family, and literally sail over a couple of kilometers to the one nearby that's competing for your business. So you have a, mm. a marketplace of both cities and flagging countries for the cities as well as the residents. And it really creates the best, um, the best uh, environment for libertarianism and capitalism and competition between states and companies for individuals as customers and uh, as, um, you know, service providers for the individuals rather than having them held hostage by the, the tyranny that's natural in a, a, landed, a landed government where you have a defined boundary and therefore uh, mm. that monopoly of violence enforced. Mm. So it's, it's very deeply theoretical, but 
it can also be practical really quick if you start getting a bunch of boats attached to each other, I guess. And, <laughs> um, and I, I want to kind of help the audience kind of picture this because I bet people are picturing very different things. I'm looking at one image that I found. I'm not sure if this is your image, but it is kind of with the Free Cities podcast and your your episode there, which I listened to. And it's almost it's like a couple different rings and like in the there's like a middle ring or a middle circle that basically looks like a Singapore and even has like tall like skyscrapers basically. And then around this sort of floating city, there's a bunch more ring. There's like an, a ring and then an outer ring and then another ring. Is, is that kind of the idea? Like you'd eventually have like floating skyscrapers and then rings around that? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's certainly a possibility. Um, I would say that um, our organization is much more focused on building up the community and the concept and the legal framework rather than actually choosing the specific technology. Uh, I think, you know, floating skyscrapers are one possibility. Although the ocean is such a vast area, I don't know that skyscrapers 50 stories tall necessarily <laughs> make sense when you have, you know, a huge amount of space to spread out. I think probably could be risky. <laughs> if I, yeah, it'd be a little risky. I mean, well, not risky. You could build them that they would, uh, that they would be stable actually, yeah. but it's just a question of cost effectiveness. Um, because the higher you go, the deeper you have to go into the ocean. Um, and the more material you have to do to keep it that high. So, I mean, frankly, I think if I was envisioning how it plays out, we're probably looking at most of the the buildings, so to speak, would probably be in the five to six story range, like you see in European cities, that is conducive to allowing sufficient density for, um, you know, both residential, commercial, real estate, um, and uh, but also you know not being excessively tall, not relying on you know elevators going up and down fifty or seventy stories. So I think you're looking at probably a, a more a medium density type development, but uh, one that's much more dynamic because. As things grow, um, if there are areas that are less dynamic and um, less economically active, they could essentially be pushed towards the outer aspects of the, the floating civilization. And the central area could be redeveloped without having to demolish. Uh, because as you build new buildings, you just move the old ones out of the way for the new ones to be placed in the center. Right. But also, I mean, you have to think about how. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's this constant uh, evolution. And uh, people are always competing for the, the central locations. Uh, and it's not competing as in knocking each other down. It's just uh, who has the best uh, value proposition. And they will always be in the, the most economically desirable locations within this structure. And we, we can get into the um, you know legal framework. But I, I want to just nail down this image a little bit better. Because okay. I, I imagine it's going to change over time, like over the decades and everything. But... If you had like a, you know, my boat and then your boat and then a pontoon party boat and then I don't know like a oil tanker, it would it's, it look, it would be kind of like ragtag all side by. Is there is there some yeah. like uniformity somehow? No, so I, I think um, <clears throat> if I had you know my current vision of how it will play out, I think we'll have a handful of very large floating structures. And I think the best technology for those right now is something called a, a monolithic dome. So it's basically a giant concrete structure. And what you can imagine is it, it's like a, a floating ball almost um, where part of it's below water, part of it's above. And then around the edges, you can have the, uh, you know, the, the, the built-in buildings where the platform itself would rent out space in these buildings to businesses or maybe people who can't afford to buy a large floating vessel. And then in the center, there would be a large marina with a whole bunch of slips where different boats could dock. Um, so you'd have a ring of businesses on the outside and then on the inside, you'd have what you would look like. You would go to any large marina, you have all the different boats and vessels docked in there. Um, and the roof would probably be, you know, some combination of glass and concrete. So you'd be able to see the sky, but it'd also provide a large amount of protection from the elements. So it would be essentially an indoor marina surrounded by a, um, a, a ring of businesses on the outside and a couple entry and exit points to let people come and go as they please. Okay. Very cool. By the way, we had uh, Jay Anson on from Palau. Um, mm -hmm. It was one of his first interviews ever. This was over a year ago, I think. And um, so we're the, the audience here is actually quite familiar with Palau as a project and what they're trying to do, which is pretty cool. Have you, have you talked to them at all about using them to be your your flag? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I've been – I've kind of – 
across to all the the free cities uh, projects that I've uh, that, that, I've, that I've met and talked to all of them. Uh, and Palau is certainly interesting. You know, I really applaud what they're doing with their digital residency program. Uh, you know, I myself was one of the first people to sign up for it, and I know it's moving slower than some people hope, but I really do think it's a a great program. And I I think it was a number of months ago now uh, I actually connected Jay with uh, Joe Quirk from the Seasteading Institute. And last I heard, they were, you know, hopefully in discussions to, um, in addition to offer this digital residency, to have Plow offer a flagging registry to individuals, whether that's with Atlas Island or any other countries uh, or any other projects around the world involved in seasteading, because ultimately uh, when you're on the ocean, you need a flag. And I think if Plow is ready to offer a digital residency card, it doesn't take too much of a stretch for them to say also register your boat. And then you really have the advantage that you have an address, an ID, and a flag that all match up. So those matching coordinates um, will really help make the argument that you have expatriated from whatever your home country is. And despite being on the ocean, you, you found a jurisdiction that you essentially is your home jurisdiction. And because you're outside of the territorial waters, it allows you to um, uh, hopefully benefit from that same zero tax regime that uh, they have on digital residents. So yeah, it's certainly, it's certainly a viable opportunity. I mean, there are other flags of convenience already in existence, but I think Plow is very forward looking and with their focus on digital residency, and blockchain technology, I think they they certainly want to uh, capture this emerging market, and uh, hopefully more to come in the in the next months and years on that. And what's the relationship between Atlas Island and seasteading? So seasteading is you know the the broader concept of building floating civilizations on the ocean. And I guess you can say seasteading is an umbrella term for any project that wants to do that. Um, their whole goal is to facilitate the legal environment to make that possible. And those groups can range from anything that is, you know, uh, all the way to um, an environmentalist movement focused on, uh, you know, social justice and restoring the environment to uh, not that we're anti-environmental, but to, to us on the other extreme, which is, an, you know, an anarcho-capitalist movement strictly focused on obtaining the maximum liberty possible. Uh, so sea setting is a very broad movement. We are um, one organization within that movement uh, that uh, you know, is very focused on the political and uh, liberty side of it and combining that with the concept of free cities, if that makes sense. Hmm. And w were you like part of seasteading before all this started and you kind of started your own thing or did you kind of hook up with them after? Yeah, no. So uh, seasteading is actually what inspired, uh, partly inspired this idea. I mean, I guess I learned just before this talk that you're also from Canada and um, you may have shared a similar journey. I started in Canada as a younger person, a conservative, and then became disillusioned with, with that, uh, moved towards libertarianism. And then I just became disillusioned with politics in general. And I discovered first the Seasteading Institute. Uh, and I thought that was a great idea, but, you know, I didn't have the the terminology beyond libertarianism to uh, you know put that into practice. Then I learned about Murray Rothbard, found the the Free Cities Foundation, and I kind of dove off the deep end into anarcho capitalism. And essentially, I took seasteading and I said, hey, you know, this is a great idea to make anarcho capitalism happen. And I didn't find another group that was really strongly advocating for that. I mean, the seasteading is too supportive of us, but they're an apolitical organization, so they couldn't be arguing for that. So. What I wanted to do was create a home for anarcho capitalists within the seasteading movement that then merges that with not just a concept of seasteading, because many seasteaders are very focused on this micronation uh, approach where they really want to have the titles and the government themselves. I would be more than happy if we could completely have no government on our seastead and everything be run by market mechanisms alone. Obviously, you know, obeying international law and using a flag for uh, for the necessary purposes, but really embrace that full uh, decentralization and market-based approach rather than uh, trying to eventually establish our own sovereignty as a country with the government. Hey guys, quick break from the podcast to tell you about job stacking. If you're a remote or hybrid worker looking to maximize your earning potential, then Rolf Holtze, author of Job Stacking, guarantees you'll be able to double your income by implementing his paycheck multiplication layering method. This is the exact system Rolf has used to take his own income and those of many others beyond 20K a month. With this method, Rolf contractually guarantees that you'll be able to double your income in 45 days. So, 
If you're interested in unleashing your earning potential and doubling your income, then click the link in the description and book a call with Rolf right now. And is Seasteading looking to establish a micro nation? No, so Seasteading in general, again, is, in general, it's a, a larger movement. Um, the Seasteading Institute is not uh, thinking in that sense in any in any regard. They are strictly focused on the technologies and the legal frameworks to allow seasteading to happen. But there are certainly other organizations within seasteading um, which are focused on trying to establish a micronation. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it's not seasteading per se, but for example, Sealand is is one of the country, the supposed countries that claims to be a new country. And there's other groups looking to do the same thing. And <clears throat> what I found is a lot of them are very busy at this stage debating, you know, what their constitution will say and what exactly their laws will be. But they haven't built anything yet and they haven't come up with a plan for where it'll happen or how it'll happen. So we're really focused on building the community and uh, the technology behind it. And then we will start off by having our organization of people move on to floating vessels in the coastal waters, uh, probably starting off in marinas near their homes and then eventually moving out into the open sea and building the floating uh, infrastructure as that technology matures. Got it. So where, where do you think is like an ideal place to set up the first Atlas Island community? Like I assume you've kind of narrowed it down to somewhere with calm waters <laughs> yeah yeah i mean <clears throat> i think uh you have to find the balance between the um environment and uh the economic situation because frankly speaking right now sea studying is a little bit of a, a chicken and an egg conundrum right i mean if you gave me 10 billion dollars i could build a, a fairly decent floating platform with a reasonable amount of infrastructure but uh the question would be who would fund that and who would move to it when it's completely empty right so you have to be able to build up that community that um internal marketplace, a circular economy where people are moving there, not just because it's a floating structure to move to, but because it actually provides them some quality of life when they move there. So our first location will have to find an area that is a combination of relatively sheltered waters, relatively favorable political environment, but also close enough to a, you know, a, a metropolitan area and an airport that it makes it feasible for people to live there when there's only 10 or 15 people, the first, the first movers to the area, right? Because it's Hard enough to find someone who wants to see stead. It's even harder to find someone who says, yeah, I'll move out into the middle of the ocean with five other people and we'll do resupplies every four months, right? I mean, you got you to get up to 500, 1,000 people before you can start thinking about moving further away from shore. And in terms of actual physical locations, um, you know, I'm not going to give specific names, but uh, through partner organizations, we are in discussion with uh, a couple of Caribbean islands, um, which I think would be a great mm -hmm. North American hub for people from, you know, Canada, the United States, Mexico, to move to and then uh, we're also looking at potential mediterranean locations for our, our european mm -hmm. colleagues so the idea being to develop at least two um uh you know two centers of uh, atlas island to uh two marinas one in north america uh, or the caribbean sorry and one in the mediterranean uh for north american and european um members respectively and then when they get big enough the idea is to move them to a more uh, calm and tropical water, which is more remote and outside of Territo water, somewhere, you know, likely somewhere between um, uh, South America and Africa, because there's a large, large area of relatively calm waters where the waves don't get more than a meter or two high at any point of the year. And there mm -hmm. are no uh, hurricanes. Got it. Got it. And I assume you're, you, you're anchoring to the ocean floor there. So you're going to the internet because what's the international international waters boundary i know they extended it after the, the whole rose island thing i saw that movie yeah um yeah so it's, it's, it's like 10 kilometers offshore or something um i believe it's 24 nautical miles actually so it's, okay. it's pretty far that works out to about 40 kilometers roughly um okay. but then also countries have the option to try to extend it to their territorial so that, to their continental shelf so sometimes it goes even farther um that being said, I mean, if you're just transiting through, it's, it's very easy to transit through any country. The question is when you, like you said, set anchor and stay in a place for a prolonged period of time, you got to make sure it's outside of those boundaries. Um, there's really two options there. One, there are things called sea mounts, which are, uh, you can think of them as, as islands that don't come above the surface of the water. So there's many areas in, in the ocean 
where despite being relatively far out into international waters, the, uh, there, there's an underwater mountain and the surface, the peak of that mountain rests maybe, you know, 50 or a hundred feet below the surface of the water. So those are options you could actually anchor onto those and uh, have a place to hold down. The other option is if you have a big enough structure in calm enough waters with very little current and very little tide, you could put some small motors on it, have solar panels, and then you can use uh, the, the energy that's generated, the surplus energy generated in these tropical areas where there's a huge amount of sunlight to uh, dynamically position yourself. So just pick a location with a GPS tag and the whole vessel just is constantly uh, adjusting position to remain in, in the same location without actually being anchored to the floor. Got it. But by the way, you're kind of like touching your microphone. I'm, I'm picking it up. If you oh, could sorry. <laughs> refrain from that a bit. Um, and you mentioned that you want your ideal situation for you. You mentioned this in the other podcast is you want a catamaran. And mm -hmm. uh, I think you, I caught earlier, you said an electric catamaran. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been uh, refined a bit, actually. I've, uh, I've been in the process of developing it. Uh, Atlas Island is what I'd call not a nonprofit. Well, not a charitable, but, uh, you know, it's a community organization. I don't see myself personally profiting from that organization because it's really just a way to bring a community together. Obviously, people building platforms will profit from it. But I'm, I'm working on developing my own business uh, where I am designing a solar electric catamaran. And what it's targeting is, is you know, the individual or the, you know, the family. Uh, you're talking a two to four bedroom uh, setup, however you want to break it down, um, with about... 1500 square feet uh, or you know uh, 120 square meters or 130 square meters of interior area and um, the idea is that not only is it perfect for atlas island but it's for the person who wants to be truly independent and be able to travel around the world so whether you want to you know sit in our marina and hang out with us or whether you want to bounce around the caribbean the mediterranean or southeast asia uh, this catamaran would have solar panels on the roof that would more than that would be more than sufficient for all of your domestic needs. So that's, uh, you know, your, your cooling, if you venture north, your heating, uh, your cooking, your entertainment, your lighting, charging all your electronics, running a Starlink setup. Uh, in addition to that, the power would be sufficient to run a, a desalination system. So you have unlimited water, unlimited power. Um, it would be enough to move at a relatively slow speed. And then the idea is we would have diesel generators as a backup if you want to move at a quicker speed. But uh, you can imagine essentially having a house floating on the ocean built to North American housing standards with all the modern conveniences, washer, dryer, stove, oven, all electric, powered completely by solar energy uh, so that you're completely independent for energy, independent for water. You have Starlink so you can connect anywhere in the world um, yeah. and then you can motor at a low speed or a higher speed if you want to use diesel. And it's really the ultimate platform for someone who wants to combine the nomad lifestyle with the comfort of not living out of the suitcase and the independence of being off grid. So that's the, the vision of the, the catamaran that I'm designing and the tentative working name for it is the Ark of Liberty, which is kind of a, a double entendre. Explain the name. So Ark of Liberty, Ark uh, could be either A-R-K as in, you know, the boat uh, that, you know, saves you from disaster uh, or A-R-C as in, you know, uh, we're bringing Liberty back through the Ark of History. I like it. Yeah. Catamarans are expensive, eh? Like I've looked at them like you, it's hard to find one under 100K for like a decent one. Yeah. So, so I guess um, expensive is relative, right? Uh, you can't build not something for nothing. Um, I, I, you can probably find a used catamaran for under 100,000 if you look after a storm and you try to find one that's been what they call demasted. So a sailing catamaran where the, the sail mast has been knocked down. And I think for people who are, um, you know, just starting out, don't have a lot of savings, that's probably the best route is to buy one of those, throw your own solar panels on it and kind of fit it out. Our target price for this vessel will be around the 500,000 mark, which is certainly not cheap. But when you compare it to housing in most North American or European cities, you're looking at about that price for a family home. So the idea being that anyone who can afford to buy a family home in North America or Europe, you know, a, a middle upper class, middle class family uh, should be able to finance or purchase one of these catamarans. Like I said, I mean, you're not going to be able to get it for $60,000, but you also can't buy a, a three bedroom home in uh, Toronto or New York or, or London or uh, Paris for that price either. So uh, we're really looking at, you know, what to compare to. And I think uh, hopefully we'll be able to target that market. There is, you know, a, 
I don't want to call it a competing, but an existing product that is a solar electric catamaran, and they really target the luxury end of the market. So they, they've proven that it's possible, but they're charging two or three million dollars for their. Mm. For can their can I Google it? What's it called? The it's called Silent Yacht. Silent Yacht. Okay, catamaran. And why does it have to be a solo catamaran? Why why do you say the word solo? Like, don't we want families and stuff? No, so solar. Solar. Oh shit, I'm tripping. Solar, yes. <laughs> <laughs> solar electric, solar panels. So, um, yeah. So our, our design uh, will be the roof will be covered with solar panels. So for the engineering people on here who are listening, have technical knowledge, we're looking at having 25 kilowatts of solar panels on the roof. Um, so, like I said, more than enough for any of your domestic needs, and then a reasonable abundance of it for uh, low speed or intermittent movement. Dude, I'm looking at this site, uh, silent-yachts.com. This is actually pretty yeah. epic. I've never seen yeah. this before. Oh, so, absolutely. Uh, if anyone you know is too lazy to Google it, um, basically it's a catamaran, which is a – would you, you say that's a double hull boat, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, and the whole, it's like a flat roof, kind of like a car, and then the whole roof is solar panels. I'm guessing yeah. they must be waterproof solar panels. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and that vessel, uh, I mean, it's, it's it's awesome. It's it's rated to go across the ocean. It's beautiful. It, it works. They're they in production. Like I said, I mean, I think where I want to differ from them is number one, the price. They're targeting the luxury market. I mean, they're putting the top tier materials. They're making fancy designs. Ours is going to be much more targeted at a very simple, uh, mass manufacturable design so it'll look a lot more like a lifeboat um, from a, a cruise ship it's gonna be a lot simpler shape uh, no crazy lines on the outside but it'll do the job and also theirs is I guess there's two approaches to building a boat right there's people who build a boat to live on and then there's people who build a floating house that moves and I'm squarely in the latter camp I want ours to have all the comforts of a home and be designed to the standards of a home uh, so that you're not dealing with a lot of the problems that you have potentially on boats like for example i mean a lot of boats when you flush the toilet or uh you know take a shower there the the, how, the the living area is down in the halls so you have to have a pump to pump the shower water and the toilet water up and out and, and and make sure that you don't flood if that pump stops working then suddenly your shower fills up with water ours is designed with standard household plumbing so that everything drains by gravity you know it's um uh, designed with a proper hvac system heating ventilation and cooling system uh, that uh, will have proper insulation so that, you know, you don't get too much condensation and it's not exceptionally expensive to keep it comfortable year round. So, um, yeah, the silent yacht is beautiful. I mean, if you're looking for uh, something like that and you have the money and uh, you don't mind the, the, the compromises, I think it's an excellent thing. I'd recommend it to anyone. But I think if we can bring that price down from, you know, $3 million to $500,000 and make it that's something that's even easier to maintain, I think we're going to open up a whole new market. Like I said, target all the people who, own houses in North America and Europe and, and want to live that lifestyle, uh, it now puts it within their reach because if they're committed, you know, you can sell your house for 600, 700, 800,000, whatever it's going for and, and buy one of these vessels and sail the ocean, be independent, never have power bills or water bills again. Hmm. If you had to guess how many of these silent yachts you think they've sold? I, I really don't know. I mean, I think it's less than a hundred at this point. They've been out a couple of years, uh, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the thing is, if you look at it, and, and you'll see what I'm talking about when you look at it, it's it's a very bespoke design. There's lots of interesting curves. It takes a lot of man hours to assemble something like that, which is why it's so expensive, um, which means that, you know, I, and their factory is not a huge assembly line. It's, you know, a couple spots. So I can imagine they, I would imagine they can only build a handful per month, which is why they're charging that price, right? So th they're really looking at, let's make a beautiful product and let's make it a luxury item where we make a large amount of profit per per ship. I mean, I'm sure they're making huge margins on these. Whereas I'm looking at what can we do to make this a, a mass produced item that can then be, you know, manufactured in hundreds and thousands per year and sold at a, a lower margin, but in higher volume. Dude, imagine if Tesla made a boat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've thought about it. Uh, it would probably, uh, be the end of my business because they'd probably have all the same ideas. But uh, as of right now, no one's, um, there doesn't seem to be interest. I mean, if Elon uh, hears this podcast and he wants to, to partner, I'm more than happy to uh, to work with you on, on bringing this to reality faster. But I mean, I think right now we've got a plan to make it happen. Um, and, uh, you know, if my business is successful, fantastic. But if I inspire other people like Tesla um, 
or you know any of the other uh, you know billionaires out there to dump a whole bunch of money into seasteading and you know build solar electric yachts, make them mass market, lower the price, then you know even better. I I'd like to make money, but even more so, I want to change the world. So if I can inspire others to improve on my ideas, then that's a win for me. Hey guys, quick break from the episode to tell you about BitRefill. BitRefill allows you to shop online and in person without banks, converting your crypto directly into merchant balance. We're talking gift cards to Nike, Amazon, Apple, Airbnb, Hotels.com, and many more, all paid for with crypto. BitRefill offers more than 10,000 gift card options in 180 countries all across Latin America, including Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Argentina, El Salvador, and many more. You can also apply the code MYLATINLIFE at checkout to get 10% back on your first purchase. Go to bitrefill.com for more information. So between uh, boats and uh, houseboats or, or floating house structures, you know, what's... You said that the ideal is a floating house. If, you know, if I'm listening to this, I'm a guy, I got a boat in Florida. Should I come down and latch on with you guys? Or is it like, are, are we anti, are we down with boats? Are we anti boats? No, no, no. So no, I, I'm in favor of boats. Um, when I said, a, when I said a, um, a floating house, what I meant is something that's designed to be lived on permanently. Right? So uh-huh. most boats, they have beds, they have toilets, but they're things that are designed to be used as a secondary purpose. What I'm talking about, is a boat. It's not a house. It has an engine, you know, it uh, or a motor. So sorry, it has a motor. It's mobile. It's designed to be hydrodynamic, move quickly ish. Um, but the idea is that it's something that's designed to be lived on comfortably year round. If you have a boat in Florida and you try and sit on there, the second you turn off the air conditioning, it's going to get hot. It's going to get muggy. The toilet will start stinking. Um, so really, boats are are good. I mean, there are people who live aboard boats. But the idea is to make that liveaboard lifestyle something that's a very easy transition for someone who's not used to living on boats, not used to doing all the maintenance himself, and doesn't have necessarily all that technical skill. So bring bring that um, that lifestyle to the people who don't want to have to make those compromises. But yeah, if you have a boat and that's you know you're happy with living on a, a boat with uh, you know 12 volt DC power, no AC outlets, no generator. Um, and a toilet that you have to pump by hand, you're more than welcome to bring it if that's what works for you. Um, I just think that if we want to target a mass market, there's already so many um, uh, compromises you're making, I suppose, by moving away from modern civilization that we want to make that jump as easy as possible for the average person. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a bit about the benefits, Mason, of Atlas Island or the benefits of I guess, living at sea in general. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we can break that down into two phases. I, I'll, I'll tackle the second part first because it's the near term. I mean, as soon as we get this design done or, you know, someone can afford a silent yacht, uh, I think, you know, a lot of expats haven't really considered or appreciated the benefits of living on a boat. Um, and one of the big benefits is that most of the places you really want to go are often on the coast or accessible by water. Um, most major European cities, many North American cities are accessible either on the ocean, on a lake, or on a large river. So if you're living on a boat full time, um, you could decide that, uh, you know, this, this winter I'm going to be in the Mediterranean and I'm going to spend a month in, you know, Antigua, a month in Bahamas, um, a month in, you know, maybe Prospera. And you can continually move around, check out all the locations that you want to see, visit them, work there, and then move somewhere else when you when your when your desire uh, fits that the other advantage um, in addition to the ability just to move for the sake of moving is that you know if you go and you buy a beautiful unit in prospera which right now you know the jurisdiction is favorable uh, you, you always run that risk that your investment is tied to the land it's it's on right you put five hundred thousand dollars into a condo in prospera and sure it's beautiful but uh what happens if next year the government uh changes again for the worse and they try to shut Prospera down or they blockade it or they try to, um, uh, you know, expropriate your property. When you're living on the ocean, you could go, you could dock in Prospera, you can, you know, uh, enjoy all the benefits of the zone, you can meet all the people there. But if things turn sour, all you have to do is flip on your motors, flip on your engines, and uh, just sail away to somewhere that's more favorable. So it really gives you that um, that power of what, what they say in seasteading is, uh, well, what our slogan is now is, is vote with your boat. And in seasteading, it's uh, the argument is voice over exit. Um, 
sorry, exit over voice, sorry. Um, it, it's, it's better to have the option to leave than to have to try and stay and fight and vote for what you want. So really a floating home of a boat uh, that's built the housing standards is the best opportunity to enact anarcho-capitalism because by the very nature of its physical structure and its mobility, it forces governments to compete for you because you're not a captive audience. I mean, I guess if you have a passport that doesn't let you travel anywhere, fine. But most people with, you know, a Canadian and American, a European passport can go many places. So if, you know, you set up shop in, uh, let's say, Mexico, and you get a big community of boats and a marina there, you have a good life going, and suddenly Mexico says, well, you know, we don't like expats anymore. We're going to charge them 70 to 70% income tax. Okay. We're leaving. We're going to take our entire community and we're going to go off to a marina in uh, maybe Bahamas, which is more favorable to our uh, situation. So it really, it really just provides you that uh, that power. It flips the table, so to speak, where you know governments are competing for you and you're no longer uh, their captive audience, so to speak. Like now, it. in terms of yeah, now in terms of the the ocean, the ocean takes that a step further. Uh, because once you make this floating community in the ocean, not only are governments competing for you, but you can have the entire infrastructure, not just the boats, but the, you know, the marina, the buildings, everything be floating. And then you have those businesses also competing for you to dock at their business. And the governments are not just competing for the residents, but they're also competing for the businesses because the businesses are also flagged in different jurisdictions. So it may be that one platform is flagged in the Bahamas and another is flagged in Malta. And, and each of them every year where they no, renegotiate their flags and they say, hey, you know, uh, Bahamas, Malta uh, changed their deal and they made it more favorable unless you, you know, decrease our fees by such and such, we're going to flip our flag over to them this year and they're going to get our business. So it really takes that uh, that to a new level. And then ultimately, the other thing to consider is even though there are rules, um, they're much more relaxed, so to speak. And the perfect example of this is the cruise ship industry. Um, I don't know if you've ever been on a cruise before, but if you look at, for example, Royal Caribbean, they're, uh, they're a company, I believe they're an American company. Uh, their vessels are made in Europe a lot of the time or China and then they're often flagged in the Bahamas uh, their crew comes from you know uh, a lot of them come from the Philippines uh, their passengers come from all over the world and then they dock in places all over the world so the question becomes you know when you're on a Royal Caribbean cruise line what law are you following right I mean and, and there is technically a legal answer to that but the real practical answer is that you're following the law of the contract that you signed when you bought your spot on that cruise and all the countries which are involved in this process are you know tacitly admitting this and uh facilitating and allowing the cruise line to operate as long as it doesn't do anything egregious right um so that's really the advantage is that even though you are technically under the flag of some country the amount of liberty that you have at sea as long as you're not you know there's no murder there's no you know rape there's no egregious crimes going on you're pretty much left alone to do whatever you want. Um, and people are not going to really question it as long as it's not egregious and morally, um, you know, repung repungent. So, and that's certainly not something that we're looking to do, right? I mean, we're not looking to be a sin city. We're looking to be a bastion of freedom. So I think being at sea really provides us the most possible freedom without the need to argue for it. And with the reassurance that if anything goes wrong, we can flip our flag to another country and, uh, and continue on without any major hiccups. Tell me more about like the benefits, the lifestyle, what you have in mind. Well, are you talking about, you know, on a boat in general or on Atlas Island? Uh, a bit of both. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, the boat, the boat is kind of, uh, I think at least the boat is a digital nomad's dream. Um, I mean, uh, let's say Atlas Island never came to fruition. I would say still, you know, buy, buy one of these uh, catamarans spend your winters cruising the Caribbean uh, where the weather's good. And then you can, uh, you know, uh, shoot over the Atlantic um, or pay someone to do so while you're on vacation, meet it in the Mediterranean. And then in the summer, you spend the, the months uh, exploring the Mediterranean in Europe. I mean, you can literally take a boat from the Mediterranean Sea all the way up to uh, Netherlands through the inland waterways of Europe, explore, you know, Amsterdam, Paris, uh, Frankfurt, Berlin, all these beautiful European cities, you can just spend time exploring them. And if you're on this boat uh, that's got all of your possessions, you know, you have the comfort of not living out of a suitcase like you would if you were a digital nomad as I currently exist. 
you have Starlink, so you're, if you, you need to work, you can just have your office set up there and every day you can spend four or five, six hours, whatever you need to from your office with great internet connection anywhere in the world. And then the rest of the time you spend it living, uh, exploring the world in, in comfort and ease without you know the hassle expense of air travel or the difficulty of living out of a suitcase. So that's you know the argument just strictly for living on a, on a boat. The argument for living on Atlas Island when we come to this, you know, if we if we took away, oh, if we take for granted all the things I already mentioned about, you know, political freedom, I think it's just, you know, if you look at like the arc of liberty with the, in, in the sense of sea, we see that civilization and liberty has constantly moved westward. You know, it started with uh, Mesopotamia and the Middle East, and then you had Greece, and then you had the Roman Empire, and then you kind of had the, the British Empire, and then it came to America, North America. Um, the problem is now that there's there's nowhere really on land for civilization to expand, and throughout history there's been this constant move of the most innovative and uh, you know industrious people wanting to look for new areas to build up because mm -hmm. they see the sclerosis of the existing states, the welfare state gets built up, uh, you see people get decadent and uh, they lose that drive to build. They want to consume instead of build, and the question becomes where do we go now? I mean, if you ask Elon, for example, right now his answer is we go to space, and I say mm -hmm. sure maybe. But space is inhospitable. It's expensive. You know, if one thing goes wrong and you die. You know, the ocean, yeah, it's you know, it's not land, but it's a much smaller jump to go live on the ocean or even in the coastal waters. You know, a couple miles or twenty miles offshore than it is to go live on Mars. And there's a huge amount of water on the planet that's uh, you know unclaimed um, and free to to live on. So I think. The real advantage, you know, there's the tax advantages, the freedom advantages. The real advantage is, is once you put all of those structures in place, you have the freest society that is insulated from all these turmoils of, uh, of mob rule and, uh, you know, uh, the constant march of uh, government intervention. The question becomes, who are you going to attract to this society? And I think the answer is it's going to be the most interesting people that you'll meet anywhere in the world. And it's not just North Americans, right? You're going to people track, people attract people from North America from Europe, from Asia, from South Asia, from Africa, all the most enterprising people who say, we want to build something. We, won't, we don't want to be held back by existing regulations and structures. We don't want to be, you know, part of this lifestyle where everyone expects the government to support them. And, you know, they don't want to work. They want their COVID checks to keep coming in. It's going to be a society of people who want to build, who have a vision for the future, who are very forward looking. So I think it's, you know, not just the financial benefits, but it's also the community benefit. This is the people that I want to be working and building with, right? Like, I don't want to keep fighting for Canada. I don't want to be fighting against Trudeau for the next 10 years, trying to win an election so that someone in marginally better gets in, right? I want, I want to leave politics behind, become apolitical, and just focus on building technology, building society, making things great. And, you know, like I said, it's not just North America. It's not just Europe. This isn't about rich people escaping. It's about hardworking people having opportunity. And that's as much important for North America as it is for the rest of the world. Because right now, and I've said this before, the most important predictor of someone's economic and you know general success in life is the country that they're born in. And I don't think that's fair. You know, if if you or I were born in North Korea, it's exceptionally unlikely right now that we would have ever gotten to where we are because of the limitations placed on us by the government. So what I want Atlas Island to be is I want it to be a beacon of freedom for everyone around the world. Anyone who's hardworking can strive to move there and build a future for themselves and their family. And it can free them from the shackles of their government, which have been holding, holding them back in the past. And, you know, I certainly hope that, you know, from developing countries, we are able to attract those people and we can give them an opportunity that would not have been available to them in their country and would have been denied to them, would have been denied to them because of their passport, which doesn't allow them to move to many of the Western countries where there are currently more opportunities. So that's really the advantage is that we provide that frontier to continue developing and pushing humanity forward that is now lost because land has been all claimed and built up. So we really need to keep pushing that frontier. And I think the ocean is a way to do that. And I think Atlas Island provides the best platform to make that happen and to ensure that we don't regress afterwards. Hey guys, quick break from the episode to tell you about BitRefill. BitRefill allows you to shop online and in person without banks, converting your crypto directly into merchant balance. We're talking gift cards to Nike, Amazon, Apple, Airbnb, Hotels.com, and many more 
all paid for with crypto. BitRefill offers more than 10,000 gift card options in 180 countries all across Latin America, including Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Argentina, El Salvador, and many more. You can also apply the code MYLATINLIFE at checkout to get 10% back on your first purchase. Go to bitrefill.com for more information. Yeah, yeah. So where are we at now with it? How long have you been working on this project? So Atlas Island, um, I want to say it's been two and a half or three, maybe three years or so uh, that we've been building this community relatively slowly. Um, I think we're at about 500 people right now in the community uh, who've expressed interest, uh, a smaller number, obviously, who are very serious about it. Um, but uh, we've been working on that for three years now, slowly building it up. And then the Catamaran project has been a little bit over a year that I've been seriously working on that. Um, so in terms of how things are playing out, I mean, I think the catamaran design should be finished this year. I mean, obviously, uh, you can't always predict things with engineering projects. and I'm not going to take any pre-orders until the design is completely ready to be built. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm hoping that by the end of this year, or hopefully the first half of this year, we'll have the design completely finalized. I mean, we've done all the engineering. I'm running double and triple checks now, and um, I'm going to be looking at getting costing estimates. And then we're also, as a group, looking at uh, where can we put these first marinas? We're in negotiations with different governments. I've got a, a handful of people who are each willing to put in at least, you know, $100,000 or $200,000 to, to kickstart a marina in a, a free jurisdiction. Um, and uh, hopefully that marina could be built within the next two or three years. I'd say within, you know, five years, hopefully we'll have a healthy community of people living on boats of some kind in these marinas in North America and Europe. And then... I hope within 10 or 15 years, we start seeing that floating infrastructure being built out. So it's certainly a long-term vision. It's not going to happen overnight. And, you know, would I be surprised if these timelines change? Not at all. But the point is that we're making steady progress towards them. And uh, it's always difficult to um, to make that zero to one transition, as Peter Thiel says. But I think, you know, in 10, 15 years, once we've proven that this can work and we've built the first one, I think you'll see a massive flourishing of uh, competing platforms, which will ultimately be good for customers, residents, and, and everyone involved. Because, you know, it's, it's not the expense, it's the engineering. And once the engineering is done and it's been proven that it can work uh, and there's another market for it, then uh, then I think we'll see it grow very quickly at that point. It'll be an exponential type growth, especially since land will not be a limiting factor. If, you know, if we have a thousand people living there and 20,000 more want to come, you know, <laughs> The, 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 the boats and the platforms can be built anywhere around the world and towed to whatever location. So it really, the, the mm-hmm. construction is not the limiting factor either. It's really the question of demand. And once we get that demand built up, it becomes a, you know, a flywheel effect and it should rapidly build. So have you narrowed it down to who's actually going to build the boat? Have you found like a Canadian boat builder or somewhere internationally? <laughs> So I've narrowed it down in the sense that I certainly don't want it to be a Canadian boat builder uh, for my personal sense. Nothing against Canadians. I mean, I, 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 it's I expensive. Like Canadians. It's expensive. And, uh, you know, my goal is to have a business that I can run remotely that is detached from Canada for, uh, you know, um, tax purposes. So the way I'm going to be structuring the business is that I will be uh, having a company, I'm not sure where it will be incorporated yet. Uh, I've just been doing it personally as a sole proprietorship show, pr- proprietorship show so far. But um, the company will be incorporated. That company will be responsible for all the design, the engineering, and the sales. And then I'll subcontract out the building to a handful of companies, shipyards around the world. I'm not interested in running a shipyard. I don't have you know the experience, uh, and frankly, other people can do it better than I can. So. The idea is that we will be the people who design it and then uh, you order from us and based on where you're located, your ship will be built at the nearest shipyard that uh, you know offers competitive pricing. Uh, oh, and one other thing I didn't mention about the Ark of Liberty is the business model. Of course, I want to make money. You know, It'll be some reasonable profit margin. I mean, nothing crazy, probably 10 or 15% uh, enough that it makes it worth our while and that we can continue research and development. But that being said, again, like I said, the goal isn't so much to make money, it's to change the world. And I think, you know, a for-profit business is the best way to do that because it allows you to keep building. But that being said, um, the design itself will be open sourced. So all the plans, the engineering, the construction drawings, all that will be available free online. Uh, And it'll be released under a um, non-commercial share alike, meaning that anyone who's bought one will have access to the designs if they need to repair it, if they want to modify it, if they want to upgrade it there's nothing to be hidden. I mean, right now, if you buy a boat, you have to dig into it yourself and try and find out how things work. You will actually get the CAD files for the Ark of Liberty. 
And if you want to design new furniture, you can pass those CAD files to someone who can look exactly how the furniture will fit in, 3D print it, and you'll know exactly it will fit correctly because those are the CAD files we use to design the mode. Um, and if you, you know, you don't want to spend $500,000 and you think that you can build it cheaper, which I think is exceptionally unlikely because molds are very expensive. Uh, but if you think you can build it cheaper, then you're welcome to build your own. The only caveat being that you can't build it and sell it for a profit. So on, on a large scale, you can build a one-off and maybe sell it, but uh, we will be the only commercial distributors of the product, but the design and uh, all of the intellectual property will, will be freely available for anyone to view online. Mm. Okay, so lots of progress on the catamarans. And what about from a legal framework perspective? Like what's the latest progress there? So the legal framework is actually surprisingly the the, the simplest part of all of this. Uh, the legal framework is that this will be, the catamaran particularly will be as any other boat. Um, it will be flagged as a vessel. And what that means is that you can think of the vessel as being an extension of the territory of whatever country you flag it in. So if you go and you you rent a flag from the Bahamas where there is no income tax, you flag your boat in the Bahamas, you live on the boat, you are now in effect living in the Bahamas, which means you pay no income tax. And that is the well-established precedent for how vessels operate. Now, obviously, you can't flag the vessel in the Bahamas and then park it in a Florida marina and say, oh, I'm in the Bahamas. That applies when you're in international waters. When you're in territorial waters, you follow the laws of the country that you're you're hanging out in. Um, in terms of the platforms, there is uh, a little bit of a um, nuance, I would say there, uh, because nothing like that really has been built. There's not, I mean, there are oil platforms, but right now that is one big project that the Seasteading Institute is working on as a nonprofit, and that is um, establishing the legal framework for flagging large floating structures that are permanently inhabited. And what they just need to do is essentially create rules uh, that govern the safety of those vessels so that they can then be insurable. And then once they're insurable, countries will be more than happy to flag them. So uh, the Seasteading Institute is making rapid progress on that. And I expect within the next couple of years, you'll see that they'll uh, have established a precedent for um, flagging large or small seasteading projects. That'll be cool. That'll be really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> the last kind of couple of questions and we get to wrapping up. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about pirates. I don't know why, but like, well, <laughs> so you know why? Because pirates are very interesting and everyone always thinks about pirates. Um, <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, pirates, uh, it's, it's a question that classically comes up. And I think the answer, <laughs> it? okay. Oh yeah. I really, you know, but there's, there's classic questions. There's pirates, there's weather. Um, those are the two big ones that come up. Hurricanes and those pirates. That's what everyone worries up. about. Um, okay. I mean, I guess it'd be really bad if you combine them and you had pirates in a hurricane where the pirate boat is flying through right, the air. Right. Shark, shark. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, pirates, uh, are really, a, a feature limited to certain areas of the world, right? I mean, would I recommend that you, although the, you know, it's gotten better control recently, would I recommend that you take your, you know, uh, 60 foot catamaran with your wife and two kid, young kids and, you know, sail along the coast of Somalia? Probably not a great idea. Uh, but, you know, can you sail up and down the coast of Florida, go to a lot of these Caribbean islands like, you know, Turks and Caicos, Bahamas, British Virgin Islands, um, you know, uh, St. Kitts where people currently sail regularly? Absolutely. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of places that are very safe, uh, assuming you take- well, I, I guess probably the idea would be like, is there a mechanism of defense when you don't have like a centralized government, right? But you still need to defend the community. Is it just everyone picks up a machete or, or is there some sort of like within the legal framework or the constitution of Atlas Island, do you have like, like how would defense work? Okay. I see. Yeah, yeah. So you're talking about when you get a big platform. So generally speaking, uh, under the free cities model, the platform operator is responsible for def defense, and they would do that through a private security operator. Um, so if you have this big, you know, floating dome with an enclosed area, you've got a, a relatively secure perimeter, and then the uh, platform operator would employ private security contractors to uh, both protect from external threats as well as to deal with any internal conflicts. So, you know, if you get into a, a fist fight or, you know, you try to injure someone or rob, then they would be there to enforce that. Um, and again, the Seasteading Institute has a lot of literature on this. It's a, a well-established precedent that, uh, you know, in international law, um, for maritime law, there are, there are precedents for how, um, you know, enforcement like this occurs. 
and the long story the long story short is that you know on a cruise ship it's the same way right a cruise ship is strictly secured by the private security offered by the cruising industry and you don't see riots mm-hmm. or you know other atrocities occurring on cruise ships in fact i think what you'll see is when you look at private developments whether that's cruise ships you know private condominium corporations things like prospera um other private uh, developments the crime rate is actually a lot lower than it is in many major american cities yeah. and that's because the person operating this this platform knows very well or the city knows very well that their residents are very free to move so they want to make it a conducive area to live um, and they will try very hard to walk that balance between making sure that police are not brutal but also are quite clear in making sure that laws are enforced and everyone feels safe there because if word gets out that you know on this platform there's you know lots of crimes occurring they're quickly going to go out of business so i think aligning the incentives for both the officers as well as the company uh, is an exceptional way to make that happen. And I, you know, I think it's a very small concern on the bigger platforms. Now on the smaller vessels, that is, you know, a bigger concern, uh, when you're traveling in the ocean, it's certainly something to think about. And depending on where you choose to flag your vessel and where you're traveling, you certainly have different options available for you. I mean, the best option is, uh, either to travel with a group or to go in safe areas. But if you really insist on going off on your own in areas, which you're not entirely sure about the safety, there are options to, uh, you know, have methods of defense available on board um, you know, again where your flag depends you could either uh, you know just have passive defenses like locks and things like that radios uh, all the way up to many countries will allow you to bring you know guns and other weapons of defense on your boat like a pistol or uh, or, or other weapons to be able to defend yourself uh, so it's certainly possible and you know there are thousands and thousands of people currently living on boats right now that have contended with this and it's really not a major problem. The The boating community is large, but close knit. So really, you know, most marinas, most places where there's boaters hanging out, everyone's in the same boat, so to speak, from a pun perspective. Um, and they all know that uh, they, they want to reach, respect each other's property. And it's really not a source for crime. I was actually just on a catamaran in the British Virgin Islands a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that surprised me the most was that there's really no way to lock the boat and there's no key to turn it on. So technically speaking, anyone could have just walked on the boat and driven it away, but they don't. And that's just, you know, that's how the culture is. It's a, a culture where people respect each other. They don't commit crime and uh, mm-hmm. they all look out for each other. Because you weren't originally like a sailor or anything. I, I remember listening to the other podcast and you no. said like, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm doing my uh, my certification or whatever, yeah, like no. trying to learn these things. Have you now since been like invited on a bunch of other people's boats and gotten the chance to do some sailing and stuff? So my sailing experience so far is I jumped off the deep end. I um, I went to Portugal and I think I spent a little bit over three weeks living on a boat there where I got my basic boating license. And I went out to Vancouver Island and I spent another week on a boat there. And then I just went to the, uh, the British Virgin Islands and I rented a catamaran there for a week. So I've got about uh, five or six weeks on on boats so far, but it's all been self-driven experience where I've been kind of taking the taking the helm. And the last week, I was the, the captain on this boat. I you know we set our own course and uh, things work things worked pretty well. So no, it's just been self-driven. I don't have any sailing background, and I guess my message to everyone is that look, I I had absolutely no sailing background. Um, I mean, I guess I was on a tiny little boat a couple times when I was younger. But uh, my message to you guys is that if you're interested. Take four weeks of your life, go spend some time on a boat, learn. You'll get comfortable with it pretty mm-hmm. quickly. You'll pick it up. And uh, not only is it useful for Atlas Island, but it's also enjoyable. I mean, it's a great way to vacation. Get a group of uh, four friends, rent a boat. You each get your own cabin. You get some. Ba- you each get your yeah. own bathroom and you sail wherever you want. You relax. T- tell me about the Portugal thing. So, um, like, I understand that if you just show up and say, hey, I'll be like a deck hand or whatever – uh, you can really get a lot of free experience and a free place to stay on people's boats. And what's what's the cer- like? You got a certification, I'm guessing. So what's that certification yeah. called? If I want to Google it and maybe do yeah, it myself. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's called. Uh, I went through a program called International Yacht Training, and the one you want to get at the very bare minimum is called the Bare Boat Skipper Course. Um, Skipper which, Course. Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, technically speaking, that takes about 15 days from nothing to being done. Um, and I, I paid for the course. I didn't. I went to Portugal because Portugal's cool. They have a long nautical history, and they had a very condensed program where instead of spending, you know, a, a week per a, a night per week, a day per week, you could spend three weeks straight and get it done. Um, so I paid for the course, um, 
and and I got my certification. Where do they do it? Like where where in Portugal? There's I see the Algarve cruising. Yeah, the Algarve. Center. That's that's where I did my first one. Yeah. But there are there are schools all around the world. I mean, depends on where you want. I mean, they have they have them in Florida, they have them in Canada, they have them in Portugal. They, literally all over the world, they have well, North America and Europe. They have these schools. So uh, it really depends on what you want to do, how you want to do it, and okay. you know what fits your travel and your budget preferences. So you can do three weeks straight, or you can do one night a week for well, any combination. Each school is free to offer it however they want. Um, I mean, and it's any kind of vessel that you want to learn on. So. There's a huge variety. I mean, it's anything from one night a week to uh, to, to three weeks straight. Uh, you can also break it up into you know five day or seven day blocks and break it down into different pieces. Um, yeah, and I guess it really depends. I mean, for me, I wanted to go visit Portugal anyways, so it was a good opportunity to tie those things together. Um, and I would definitely recommend the Algarve Cruising School. Uh, I did my second course, which was specific to catamarans out at the uh, the Nanaimo um, Nanaimo uh, yacht club i think it's called in in bc mm -hmm. um but yeah they're available all over i mean certainly like you said if you want to you can uh try and hang around and see if you can offer to help out on people's boats you can learn that way it really i guess depends on where you are in life and you know right now i'm, on, I'm at a point in my life where i value my time more than money uh so i would rather pay you know four thousand dollars and get it done in a couple weeks than uh you know break up my schedule for a year and a half and sail in cold Canadian waters. Right. So it, it really a year depends. And a half, eh? If it was one. Well, day. I mean, it, it depends. I mean, it depends on what you need to get the experience. Right. So uh, it really depends on how you want to do it. There's a variety. I mean, the IYT is just one option. There's also um, the American sailing association. There's the, uh, the Royal, uh, the Royal yachting association from the UK. So there's a lot of options. The important thing is to get some kind of bare boat skipper certificate and ideally an international certificate of competence, um, which will allow you to sail any vessel up to 24 meters anywhere in the world, um, obviously within range of coast. I mean, it, it goes up from there. Right now I'm working on my Yacht Master certification, which uh, you know qualifies you with insurance to go further out from shore, but it's a gradual progression. Um, and I think you know starting out with a bare boat skipper and then just getting experience from there is probably the best way to go. Mm -hmm. And Canada, I think it's called uh, Sail Canada? Yeah, they're, yeah, there's Sail Canada. IYT also has programs in Canada, but yeah, they, they, you know, they're all variations on the same theme. And uh, one of the things you'll find is that the marine world is to some degree uh, an uh, anarchist. Um, there are always competing organizations trying to offer similar products for your business. And there is no one world authority that says you have to have this certification. They all compete. And if they offer a good enough certification, everyone says, yeah, you know, we'll accept Sail Canada certification. Yeah, we'll accept uh, the Royal Yachting certification. So there's no, it's not a hierarchical thing. It's all these organizations, again, competing for your business. Um, and I just chose IYT, but the, certainly all the other ones have great products and they're all very similar. Mm. And they're all kind of recognized. Like if you did it with Sail Canada, <clears throat> is that recognized by IYT or international So it's standards? not recognized. It's not recognized by IYT per se, but um, if you can get, you know, that international certificate of competency and or the bare boat skipper, then it's usually recognized by insurance companies around the world. I mean, the other option is just to buy your own boat um, and spend time sailing it. You technically, you only need a certification in Europe. Uh, if you want to just sail around America and Canada, you can get your, um, your 25 multiple choice question exam and uh, sail around North America with your own boat. But if you want a pleasure craft called, operator license, is that what you're yeah, talking about? Yeah, that's good enough in Canada. But if you want to charter a boat, like if, like I did the other week, if you want to go and rent a half million dollar boat um, and get insurance on it, they're going to say, well, what experience do you have? And they're going to look and say, uh, does this meet our standard? And I think, you know, when you've got a couple of solid weeks on a boat, it makes it more likely to say yes. And then once you get your first charter under your belt and you haven't crashed it, uh, it makes the next one easier to get. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. There's no liability with these things. Like if you rent a boat and mess it up, that's covered by insurance. Well, again, it depends. I mean, it depends on what the chartering company offers, right? I mean, if they see that you've got your skipper's license and you've got, you know, a number of weeks at sea, uh, they'll give insurance to you where there's a deductible. Um, usually they, I think they insist on having insurance because very few people will be able to put a fifty five hundred $500,000 deposit down to cover the cost of the boat. So uh, they'll, they'll make you uh, be qualified to have insurance and then they'll make you have and then they'll make you insure the boat when you rent it as a condition of them renting it to you okay got it got it yeah i'm definitely gonna look at these certification courses i think it's good for anyone like 
me, mm -hmm. I just love the idea of getting certifications whenever possible. And I mean, it's kind of like a driver's license in a way, like, yep. you know what I mean? Just to have like a, a boater license. I have my pleasure craft operator license, but that's obviously not sailing. Um, so and I the should, pleasure craft operators license, like I, what I, I, I did it too as well. I found that it's just kind of roughly knowing the rules. When you get into one of these courses, you really, not only do you learn how to sail, but you really learn how to apply these rules in practice and you get experience with it. Because it's one thing to read something in a book. It's another thing to spend three weeks living on a boat and uh, sailing it around and, you know, not crashing into other boats. <laughs> yeah. Did you or, do one or, with the keel boats or is that different? Um. So I did my, my first course was on a boat with a keel. It was a monohull sailing boat. And then the second course was on a catamaran. Okay. This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you in part by Job Stacking. Introducing Rolf Haltz's Paycheck Multiplication Layering Method, a revolutionary approach that redefines the traditional career path. This is Rolf's new Done With You program where he'll work with you to implement job stacking for yourself. With this method, Rolf contractually guarantees that you'll be able to double your income in 45 days. So, are you ready to step out of the shadows of job insecurity and step into a world of career abundance? Then just click the link in the description of this episode, book a call with Rolf, and start walking the path of unleashing your earning potential with job stacking. Okay, yeah, I'll definitely take a look at that. Um... I saw the movie Rose Island quite recently, like a couple of weeks ago, and it really impacted me a lot. I thought it was sick. I, I imagine you saw the movie Rose Island. I actually haven't seen it. I mean, I've I roughly heard the story about you know them trying to Come build this on. island in Italy, but it's on Netflix. <laughs> it's on Netflix. You have to see it. You have. To I see actually it. don't have a Netflix account, so I'll have to uh, I'll have to watch it at some point when I'm visiting someone with Netflix. Just stream it illegally or something. I'm sure it's out there. <laughs> Dude, Rose Island, sick. It's um for anyone listening, it's um a guy who built a platform in the sea, off the coast of Italy, yeah, uh, on the Adriatic side, and he, um and he you know declared it a sovereign nation, and he kind of took it all the way to the European Court of Justice or something like that, and um he was actually gaining traction in terms of like within the gut within like the appeals process or whatever and then the italian government just came in and like blasted them basically and like took it from him after i think i think it was only up for like six months or something like that but they started doing like yeah. they started making stamps and like all this stuff. but anyway it was like a really cool story of just like one man's yeah. One one man's uh, motivation and enthusiasm to build something and like kind of how he engineered everything and everyone yeah. didn't believe in him and he like yeah. made it happen and, and became became a guy, you know, uh, so it, it was really, really cool. I liked it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think on, on the same note, the, the interesting one that I find from a historical perspective, Sealand is interesting. I don't know if you followed that at all. Which was the uh, the platform Sealand? in like the in like the, the northern UK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, southeastern UK, the north, the, the channel. Yeah, the channel, it's okay. an abandoned. Yeah, it's it's an abandoned uh, military fort. Actually, that this guy, I think he's been there for thirty years or so. His family, and basically, Didn't they, like, give it to his kids or something. Then the original guy yeah, kind of like get to a yeah. Home. So the initial guy took it over, and there's like a lot of stories with it that are pretty interesting. I mean, one of them is that uh, there was actually an attempt. Um, an attempted invasion by someone else who wanted to take it. And there was like a, you know, there was a, there was a gunplay and these guys defended it from being invaded. Um, and then uh, there was also a time when the British Navy, after they expanded the ter territorial waters to include this fort again, came and said, Hey, you got to get off. And he basically, again, didn't shoot anyone, but shot back at them and resisted them taking him off of it. And they said, okay, it's not worth the fight. And they left him there. And he's been, <laughs> they've been there this whole time. So it's, you know, uh, there, there was a negotiation with people from the German government, if I understand correctly. So, you know, to some degree, it's a joke, but also it's kind of interesting that it's been around for decades and it's still there. Um, and, you know, de facto, the British government probably doesn't care enough, but they let this guy keep selling stamps and passports for this uh, this platform. But I think, um, you know, the one more interesting, the, the more interesting one, which in all honesty, you know, I saw it at first and I thought, OK, this is ridiculous. 
but has grown on me is uh, is Lieberland. I don't know if you followed that project, but uh, yeah, yeah we've, had a, we've had some people on the podcast. Yeah, so, so Vit, and I met him a couple times, and I've more and more become impressed with what they're doing. I mean, from my eyes, the, the legal basis for his claim is sound. They're approaching things in a reasonable manner. They're persistent. And, you know, they're slowly working to build things there. And, you know, I don't know how it'll pan out. Maybe Croatia and Serbia will come together and eventually one of them will claim it. But uh, to me, it's quite interesting. And I think it's, you know, the the best uh, Terra Nula, Terra, Terra, Terra Nula. Nula case in existence right now. Um, and I, I think it'll be interesting to see how that develops. So, yeah, I mean, there are these interesting ideas. And, um, you know, uh, um, Lieberland has to some degree, uh, started working on a seasteading side of things. They have a, a platform actually out in the, um, in the, river uh, there. the Persian Gulf, I think. And then they also oh. have some floating platforms right near their islands. So uh, they're an interesting development too. I, and I mean, like, like I said, these are very interesting and I cheer them on as people of like-minded libertarian beliefs. Um, but ultimately when it comes to Atlas Island and myself, like I said, I don't want to get into these arguments with the government, right? I don't want, I don't want to have to try and argue what is this, our territory, is it not? I want to use these clear-cut rules that we have for flagging and say, look, we're flagged under the Bahamas. We're not paying any taxes. No one questions it, right? Like, no one goes up to the oasis of the sea with Royal Caribbean and says, hey, you should be paying taxes in Canada because you've docked here once. No, that's not how it works. Everyone's accepted it. So why not? Like, why argue? Why, why, why compete? Why yell? Why scream? Why try, why try to change other people's mind? Take the exit option instead of the voice option. Vote with your vote and choose to live on Atlas Island where we don't have to argue these things. And the law is already clearly on our side. We just need the technology, the community, and the funding. Yeah. Vote with your boat. So when's the first um, cast off? Like, when? when's the first, like, you must be... You must have some kind of, um, I don't want to call it a trip, but your first, yeah, your first trip plan, you get 10 boats, 50 boats together and make a go of it. What do you have? Do you have, what's up with that? We, we don't have that exactly planned yet. I mean, I know there are a couple of people actually in our group who are already living on boats. So really it's a question of when we get a critical mass of people that decide we're going to go to one location. My hope is, like I said, within the next couple of years, we'll have a marina that we build. And then hopefully at least five, ten people will move to that marina to start and we can build from there. Um, you know, I, I maybe some people will get together and have like a little uh, flotilla trip somewhere. But I think really it'll be once we get a marina built that uh, that we'll start seeing our community come together in the real world. I'm looking forward and to it. Like I said, I think yeah, like I said, I think the first place will be in the Eastern Caribbean. I had wanted to do a Prospera, but um, just looking at the you know the 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 geography of the Roatan Island and generally where people sail, I think the Eastern Caribbean is a much more um, like Gren- Grenada highly and proud. stuff. Yeah, Grenada and you know Saint Kitts and Antigua and. Yeah. Um, yeah, Virgin Islands. I think if you look at the map, there's just thousands and thousands of boats constantly perusing those areas, whereas Roatan is kind of isolated. So I think, you know, if you go to the Roatan route, you know, it's a beautiful island, but I don't know that it's the best location to start a seasteading platform. Whereas let's say we picked, you know, Antigua or St. Kitts, two countries with zero tax. If we picked either one of those and built a nice marina, um, it could be both profitable and a great start for our, our seasteading community. And there, yeah, because there's there's thousands of boats there, right? And so you basically have to just be like, hey, latch on to us for a bit, or switch your flag of incorporation, maybe. And yeah, like how, yeah, exactly. What, what would the <laughs> what would the pun intended onboarding process be for um, for you know some boats that are already there, like in the area? So again, it's it's really just developing community. So if we build a marina. You don't have to change anything. You can just come and park in our marina, pay them mooring fees, and and that's it, right? Uh, so step one is to build a, a physical, or step two, I guess, is to build a physical marina, and uh, people will rent or buy slips in it, and you dock mm. up there. And each boat can be flagged in their own country. That's the beauty of it. Like I can be parked next to you. You could be a Bahamas boat. I could be a Saint Kitts boat, okay. and the guy next to us could be a Malta boat, and we can all be parked next to each other, and it doesn't matter. So it's really the individual choice of where you want to flag. It's just a question of choosing to dock in the same place. So you you get a physical marina when you get fifty or a hundred or a couple hundred boats in that marina that are all living together, and you've got a little bit of a community developed where you know you've got your your electrician who works there, you've got you know a, a doctor, you've got um, 
uh, hair cutter, you've got someone who runs a restaurant, you get all these businesses run by people in the marina, then you can look at the next step would be to build a floating platform of some kind and moving a little bit out to sea. So that's really the, the progress of how things would occur. Awesome, man. I'm looking forward to it. So I guess we both have some homework. I'm going to go get my uh, my skipper license, my sailing license. You've got to watch <laughs> Rose Island. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and uh, looking forward to, to keep up with your project over time. Uh, maybe we can check in like a year from now, see how it's going. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I guess if anyone wants to get involved, how, how can they get in touch with you? Uh, I mean, it's my, my name, Mason.Lachina at atlasisland.org. Probably the easiest, just go to Atlas Island, A-T-L-A-S-I-S-L-A-N-D.org, and uh, you go to the contact page. Uh, we also have a Telegram group, which is at Atlas Island. Um, that's where the most activity occurs. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out um, and uh, happy to chat with anyone. I mean, I know it's a big world, but when you start running in the Liberty Circles, you realize that uh, there's a lot of overlap. I mean, we have a lot of mutual connections, so I'm sure that there's other people in your circle that uh, know people in my circle. And really, like I said, the goal is just to build up that liberty and uh, provide as many opportunities as possible. So whether you want to support Atlas Island or whether you want to partner or whether you just want to say, hey, Mason, I've got this project that you might be interested in, happy to chat about any of these ideas. Uh, you know, anarcho-capitalism, libertarianism, seasteading, free cities, that's, uh, that's my passion. And, you know, I think that's the way that we're going to make the world a better place for everyone. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, all the links will be in the show notes uh, for anyone that wants to get in touch with you and learn more about Atlas Island. And this has been another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Again, my guest today, Mason Lashena. Pronouncing yeah, Lashina. that right? Lashina, yeah. It was very Lashina. nice uh, chatting with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mason Lashina, Atlas Island. Um, guys, if you're listening to this on YouTube, please subscribe, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, please subscribe, whatever podcast platform you're on really helps grow the show. This has been another episode of My Latin Life Podcast. Thanks to Mason and thanks to the audience for listening. Thank you. <laughs>